Thank you, Youth Praise Team. It's a good transition to where we're going to be in the Bible this morning, that God is in this story, that He wants to be in all of our stories. Amen? Uh, no matter where you are, what you're going through right now, God has a plan for you, even though it may not seem like it. In fact, let me ask you this question. What are you building your life on? Think about it. What are you building your life on right now? What are the things that you are building your life with? And then who are you building your life around? See, what we build our life on, what the things we build it with and who we build it around, that actually matters. It matters now. It will matter in 10 years. It will matter in 50 years if you're still here. And it will matter long after you're dead and gone. What you build your life with around and on, that matters. In fact, Jesus trying to make this point, he had just finished preaching his famous sermon. He didn't entitle this, we entitled it the Sermon on the Mount, but he just finished preaching that sermon. And to wrap it up in Matthew seven, he said this to the crowd. He said, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock and the, the rains fell, the floods came, the wind blew and beat against that house, but the house did not fall because it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them is like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rains came and they fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was its fall. Now, did you hear what Jesus just said? He says that no matter who you are, no matter if this is your first time in church or you've been here every single Sunday from the moment you were in your mama's womb, everybody is going to deal with hurricane force problems in their life at some point or another. And the question is, when the hurricane beats against your life, what will remain standing? What is it that will remain standing when you receive that dreaded phone call from the doctor, how will you respond? When you get that pink slip from your employer, by the way, kids, a pink slip's the way they used to tell you you're fired, right? When you get that email or that HR visit, how are you gonna respond? When that person walks out of your life, who are you turned to? See, the, the deal is when life really just crumbles around you, how will you respond? This is really a question of faith, is what we're going to talk about this morning. It's a question of faith. Faith, we talk about it a lot. Our culture looks at it as something that's easy believism, maybe, or maybe it's wishy-washy. You believe this this day, you believe the, this the next day, but the Bible doesn't talk about it that way. In biblical faith, it's rock solid. It is founded. And it, it is literally, simply, and, and uh, uh, Libby's already described it and defined it for us, but for us in this moment, it's very simply taking God at his word. That's faith. Taking God at his word. Or we could phrase it simply trusting Jesus. That's what Jesus was talking about as he wrapped his sermon up. If you hear these words of mine and do them, if you trust me enough to live this way, then when everything falls around you, you will be standing. See, God doesn't want your life to come to this horrific crash and crumble to pieces. In fact, he wants your life, he wants my life to be rock solid. And I love the fact in God's word that he even shows us a, a very intimate moment where we see this actually take place in somebody's life. You want to see that? I want to see that in my life. I want you to see that in your life, but we get to see it in this guy's life. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 20. In this scene, if you've ever wanted to be a fly on the wall and man, I wish I could have been there kind of, kind of thing, this is it. Because we're going to go behind closed doors, locked doors inside of this small little room where there is this disheartened and distrusting disciple named Thomas. And in this moment, this most intimate of moments that we have in the New Testament, we see Thomas's faith go from being crushed 
to being one that is consumed with Jesus. I mean, he had spent ye several years with Jesus. All the disciples had. All their hopes rest in Jesus. And yet, three days before this, Friday around 3 p.m., Jesus dies on the cross. He's buried shortly thereafter. Their hopes are dashed to pieces. Life has crumbled around them. This happens sometimes Sunday evening. And in this beautiful scene, Thomas's faith goes from being crushed to being consumed with Jesus. Do you want your faith to be that kind of faith? Do you want your faith, the faith of your kid, to go from being crushed in this life to one that's being consumed with Jesus? The faith of your spouse, do you want this for your spouse? Do you want this for a family or do you want this for your coworker that's dealing with some difficult issue right now? This is what happens in this story. And in this, what we find are five biblical traits or truths that are life-changing when it comes to biblical faith. And we're just going to walk through the story. I just want to make mention of these five brief truths and traits that life, that life change happens when we look at biblical faith and when we employ biblical faith. Here's the first one. The first truth here is that biblical faith is transparent. Biblical faith is transparent. Look at verses 24 and 25. It says, now Thomas, one of the 12, called the twin. We don't know who the twin is. He's just, that's one of his uh, nicknames. That's the nickname that he has. He obviously ha probably is a twin. We just don't know who it is because it never names that twin. Thomas, one of the 12, he is one of the 12. This is minus Judas now. Judas has died. But nevertheless, this is how he's known. Thomas, one of the 12, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. He was not with the other disciples. If you go back a few verses in verse 19, you, Jesus appears to the disciples. So John is saying, hey, Thomas wasn't a part of this. So when he was not with them when Jesus came, so the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his hands in the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Now, unfortunately, Thomas gets the unfair caricature of as what? Doubting Thomas, right? <clears throat> I'm not so sure that's very fair. There obviously, we'll talk about a little bit of it. There is some doubt there, but this is not Thomas's uh, MO. This is not who he is uh, normally when we see him. So if we see him throughout the book of John, and then we come to this place and, well, he's just doubting Thomas. Don't be a doubting Thomas. That's not really fair to Thomas. And we'll talk about that in a second. But what I want you to know and what you need to notice first is that Thomas was not the only one that had questions and obstacles to overcome here. Because if you go back to verse 1 of chapter 20, guess who we see there? Mary Magdalene. Jesus had just worked a miracle in her life. And yet in verses 1 and 2, I mean, she shows up at the tomb to finish the burial preparations. But when she got there, all she saw was the stone rolled away. And so she freaks out, right? Because she thinks somebody has stolen Jesus. And so she runs to, to Peter and John and she tells them, hey, somebody's taken Jesus. Somebody's taken his body. And so they run to the tomb. So she comes back later. She still has questions. She's still confused. She's still not understanding what actually happened. She's still struggling in her own right in her faith. And so she has this conversation with two angels. And how that happened, I do not know. And she doesn't freak out. But she has these, this conversation with two angels. And then she has a conversation with Jesus himself, although she thought he was the gardener. And so she's asking, where did you take him? Just tell me so we can bring him back. It wasn't until Jesus addressed her. This is important. He came to her and he called her by name, Mary, and all of a sudden, she understands who Jesus is. Fast forward in the story, the disciples, verse 19, they also had obstacles to overcome. Mary had already told them, hey, I've seen the risen Lord. They're not understanding it, but why, why, would, why would we say that? Well, where are they? They're behind locked, closed doors too. They're still in fear. They, they don't know what to do. Their Lord has died. Now somebody's taken his body and, and she's saying that he's alive. They don't understand what to do. It wasn't until Jesus shows up behind these closed doors, he 
comes to them in their moment of obstacles and doubt. He comes to them and he shows them his wounds that they believe. Now here we have Thomas virtually doing the same thing. Look, all Thomas is guilty of is saying what we all would have said anyway out loud. I mean, wouldn't he? You all have those friends that are in your friend group and they're the ones that you can, you can count on to speak for the group. We're not gonna say it, but so-and-so sure will. That's Thomas. You know why Thomas does that? Because Thomas is a realist. Any realist in here? Sure you are. I know you. There's a lot of realists in here. Thomas, is, he was a realist. We know that because we can go back to John chapter 11. And Thomas is the one that when Jesus, basically he said, hey, we're heading back to Jerusalem. Thomas is the one that responded, hey, let us go also that we may die with him. He knows exact. he is a realist. He doesn't, he doesn't look at life in gray, uh, shades of gray. It is black and white. In John 14, 5, he's the one that asked the question that every one of them were thinking. Jesus is saying, hey, I'm going to prepare a place. And when I go to prepare that place, I'm going to come back and get you. And you're going to be with me. And Thomas is like, hey, dude, I don't even know where you're going. Where are you going? He's a realist. In chapter 20, he refuses to take the word of others, but wants to see Jesus for himself. He refused to believe something as crazy as a resurrection I mean, I don't know about you, but they didn't have the Bible like this. They didn't have the New Testament that says, hey, Jesus rose from the dead. <laughs> they're living this out. And they're saying, this guy is alive? Are you crazy? Unless I see this, I'm not going to believe this. See, the deal is, I love this about the Bible. Spurgeon's the one, I think, that coined the phrase, but you don't have to defend the Bible any more than a lion has to defend itself. See, God's not scared of doubters. He's not scared of realists. He's not scared of skeptics. He's not scared of our questions that we have when it comes to big things of the faith. I mean, you don't have to defend the Bible any more than you have to defend the lion. All you have to do is just open up the cage and let the lion loose. The Bible is perfectly capable of defending itself. God is not scared of our questions. He is not going to shrink back if we get angry at what life is giving us. God is not like that. And there's a transparent aspect to our faith that we can be real about our struggles. We can be real about our problems. We can be real that this moment in my life does not feel very good. I clean that up for you, by the way. We can be real with that. We don't have to pretend that life is horrible sometimes, that we have to deal with problems in our life sometimes. We all struggle with that in our life. And yet it's when we, we, we go through those moments that they reveal the depth of our faith. So we need to be honest. We need to be transparent about our struggles and the problems that we deal with in life. You can't bottle those up. I mean, you, you need, it does no good to deny them. It does no good to keep those inside. We need to be transparent about them so Jesus can do something with them. Amen? So the first truth is, look, biblical faith is absolutely transparent. We don't try to cover anything up. We take the mask off. We put that aside. And we just are ourselves in front of God. Because he sees us for who we are anyway. The second truth is that biblical faith is appealing. Biblical faith is appealing. Look at verse, starting with verse 26 there. It says, eight days later, that's the next Sunday now, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Same thing he said earlier to the, er, the other uh, 10 disciples. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. Now, Think about what Jesus is saying here. I'm going to make this, I'm going to draw this to, uh, conclusion in a second, but just think about what he's saying. Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Quit disbelieving and start believing, Jesus says. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Both Greek, Hebrew, my Lord, Kyrios, Messiah, my God, Elohim. He puts both of these Greek and Hebrew 
uh, text together here. My Lord and my God. I know you noticed this, but earlier when I went through chapter 20 real quickly with you, Mary was confused and Jesus came to her. The disciples were cowering in fear and Jesus came to them. Thomas is in disbelief and guess who shows up? Jesus does. I love this about Jesus. It's what makes our faith, the biblical faith, so appealing. Is that Jesus does not chastise Thomas for his unbelief. He doesn't kick him out of the group. He doesn't send him off to, uh, to school to learn more about his word. He doesn't make fun of him. He doesn't do any of that. He came to him in his unbelief. He invited Thomas to come and investigate Look at the power of Jesus' invitation. Man, I love this. Do you remember what Thomas said to the disciples? This is what I was getting at just then. Do you remember what he said to the disciples? Unless I do these things, I'm not going to believe. What does Jesus invite Thomas to do? To do those very things, right? Hey, Thomas, touch my hands. Put your hands in my side. Do these things. Now, the... the part I want to draw your attention to is both awful and awesome, okay? Let's just be honest with it. It's the fact that Jesus hears us when he's not around us. You ever thought about that? Jesus is not in the room with them when Thomas says this, and he hears Thomas, and he comes to Thomas in his time of need. Thomas is dealing with this great unbelief, and yet Jesus shows up and says, Thomas, if this is what it requires for you to have faith, then hear. Now, sometimes we need to remember that Jesus does hear us <laughs> when we speak, right? That can be awful sometimes. Maybe it would help us in the checkout line or the drive through But sometimes it's awesome. That all we have to do is cry out to Jesus and we know he hears us. That he comes to us in this moment of our struggle, in this moment of our disbelief. But notice what Thomas does do and does not do. Jesus invites him. He says, unless I touch you, I'm not going to believe in you. And Jesus says, okay, here, Thomas, here I am, touch me. What does Thomas do? Does he touch him? No, John says nothing about Thomas touching him. He may have, John didn't write it. John's not concerned about what Thomas did, but what Thomas said. Thomas's reaction to Jesus's invitation is, my Lord and my God. I mean, Thomas went from being the biggest doubter in the Bible to being the greatest confessor in the Bible. This will come up in just a few minutes, but Thomas's confession, this is his personal confession of faith here. And it matters so much is that all of our personal confession of faith is basically this. If you want to know, have I trusted in Jesus? Is that your confession? Is that your profession of faith that Jesus is my Lord and he is my God? That's it in a nutshell for all of us who are believers. Thomas got it. Jesus was gracious enough to come to him in his doubts and his skepticism and his realism. And he's the same with us. Number two, I mean, number three, let me keep moving. A third life-changing trait of biblical faith is that faith is a blessing. Look at verse 29. Faith is a blessing. Jesus said to him, speaking to Thomas, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. So I'm still going to stand by, and I'll explain it, but I'm still going to stand by that Jesus does not chastise Thomas here. In fact, uh, he does quite the opposite, in my, in my opinion. The translation in the question form makes it seem like he's getting on to Thomas. Okay, so what, you only believe in me because you see me? That's kind of how we read that. But that's not how the Greek reads that. The Greek uh, text is more of a statement such as, you believe in me because you have seen me. It doesn't tell us if the, the mode or the mood behind that. It just says that Jesus is saying, Thomas, you believe in me because you've seen me. And that's important. It's really important, actually. You see, it's important because Jesus is affirming Thomas's profession of faith. He's affirming Thomas's confessional statement at that point. 
Because when what happens is, uh, if you fast forward, and I'm going to try to get through this kind of quickly. If you fast forward, is that, well, let me, let me hold that. I, I'm getting off on a rabbit trail. I'll come back to that in a second. Stay with me. But look at the, the eyewitness testimony matters, okay? The faith that we have, and I'll, I'll come back to this, but the faith that we have is built on the eyewitness testimonies of the disciples. Thomas needed to see Jesus because he was a disciple. But I want you to look at what Jesus says next. He, he takes this affirmation of Thomas's confession and then he gives it a blessing to people who have never seen Jesus in the flesh. And, and Jesus's words, when I first saw this and I started thinking through this, his words became more impressive than we probably think about and imagine at first. I mean, we naturally think that, man, if I could only see Jesus, if I could only touch Jesus, man, everything would be awesome, right? I mean, that wouldn't be cool. I mean, to have Jesus preach to you, that'd be pretty awesome, right? I'd love to sit under that. But Jesus says, hey, guess what? It's better, you're more blessed if you don't see me and you still believe. Jesus sees this the other way around. We see, man, if I could just feel Jesus, if I could just touch him and see him, then I would have no problems having faith in him. But Jesus says, hey, look, it's more blessed. You're going to be better off if you actually believe without seeing me. Why is that? You ever thought about that? Why, why is it that we don't get to see Jesus right now? Well, let me illustrate it with this story. There, this is a true story of a guy that I personally know. And the story still blows me away. It's almost kind of like one of those Casablanca of all the people in the world and all the moments in time, you know, that kind of thing. But, all right, this guy <clears throat> did what we all do around this time of year, getting close to that. He got his Operation Christmas Child shoebox and he boxed it up with all these things for a little boy. Um, and he put a notebook in there um, that he had written some things in to just kind of help encourage that little boy. And he put some other things in there that would uh, just be a blessing to this little boy. And he gave it to the church, the church, large church. They sent it uh, to the packing place and they packed it and sent it around the world. Fast forward about a year later, he takes a trip on a mission trip with that church to Indonesia. Think about how many people are in Indonesia. There are a lot of people in Indonesia, okay? A lot more than America. So he's there ministering in this, uh, to this orphanage. And he sees this notebook that he's like, hmm, that looks a lot like the notebook that I gave this little boy uh, uh, a year ago. And so he starts thumbing through this notebook with the translator and it's his notebook. And then he asked about some of the other things that he had put in that box. And he's thinking, man, this is crazy. So he asked, hey, hey, translator, I don't know what the translator's name is, but he had the translator take him to the little boy's place where he was staying. And so he meets this little boy that lives in a different culture, different country, halfway around the world. A year later, the very shoe box that he gives this little boy, he gets to meet this little boy. And I asked, and I said, what was the feeling there to know that there's 8 billion people in the world and all these kids get shoe boxes and you get to meet the one coincidentally, right, to do this. He said, well, it was surreal. It was just a crazy feeling. The fact that it's surreal that I get to, you know, meet the one that I gave this gift to. Then I asked, I said, but what was it from the little boy's perspective? And he said, you know, I'm not sure, but there was a lot of hugging, a lot of joyful, inexpressible joy that this little boy had. Because you got to think, this guy was not just a representative of some big company that gave a shoebox. This guy was not even a representative of some big church that sent the shoebox. That this little boy is now connecting that, man, here is a face with somebody that gave me a gift. Now, in a very, very, very small way, I think what this illustrates is when Jesus says it's more blessed that we believe and we don't see because there's coming a day when we literally get to put the face with the name. And, and, and in that moment, can you imagine the inexpressible joy that we experience? 
When Jesus becomes not so much of a person that we talk about and that we believe in and that we, 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 we submit to so that he can live through us and that we worship, but that he is literally right there in front of us. Can you imagine that? Paul, Peter says it this way in 1 Peter 1, 8 and 9. He says, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Thomas Adams puts it like this. It is the office of faith to believe what we do not see. And it shall be the reward of faith to see what we do believe. Man, maybe God wants us to take him at his word that one day we will see him face to face. Wouldn't the first time that we see Jesus face to face be so much sweeter than when we see him just around us all the time right now? Wouldn't our faith be so much stronger right now of believing without the tangible evidence of actually seeing? It, Jesus says it is blessed to have this kind of faith. Fourth one. Real quick, look at me, uh, look with me at verses 31, at 30 and 31. Faith is also rooted. It's rooted. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. So Thomas's statement of wanting to see Jesus with his own eyes and Jesus' uh, statement of blessedness for those who see or who believe without seeing, this leads John to write these two verses. And if you, ever, if you ever want to see what the clearest purpose statement in any book of the Bible, it's this right here. John says, hey, here is why I wrote all this down for you. So that you will see Jesus and you will believe in him. Our faith is not based on sight, but it is based and it is rooted in God's word. Our faith is rooted in the word of God. And that is important. It is not rooted in some experience that you have. It is not rooted in how blessed financially God may make you or not make you. It is not rooted in anything else. It is rooted in the word of God. And there's a lot of things that Jesus did, John says, but John wrote certain things down in his gospel so that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God. Thomas's confession there becomes our confession and becomes the confession of all new believers. And I was about to get ahead of myself a while ago, but, but this is where this comes up, is that this is important because this gospel, John wrote this gospel around AD 70 to AD 100, somewhere around that time. By the time John wrote this gospel, all those who had seen Jesus alive in the flesh, guess what? They're not here anymore. They've passed away. They've died. And so... John is saying, I have written these things to you so that when we're all dead and gone, you can believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. You see, our faith is rooted in the Word of God. Yes, it is eyewitness testimony. Absolutely. But our faith is rooted in the Word of God. That's how we come to know who Jesus is. That's how we come to know who we are without Jesus. That's how, we, that's how come we know what we are to do in this world. We're to respond to Jesus. We're to give him our life. We're to turn from our sin, turn to God through believing in Jesus. We know that because of God's word. The quick application is if you're not rooting yourself in God's word, number one, what are you rooting yourself in? Number two, quit because all those other things will burn up and go away. Only God's word is going to be eternal. So if you want a good and the best investment for your time, root yourself in God's word. Fifth one, then I'm finished. Faith is transformational. Faith is transformational. The end of verse 31, look at that. These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing something you do every single day, continually, you may have life in his name. So the result of believing in Christ is that we may have life in the name of Jesus. And, and most of the time when John uses the word life, he refers to eternal life, and that's the case here. 
And so when we believe in Jesus, when we turn our lives over to him, we give him the reins of our life, then we are given eternal life. Eternal life doesn't start the moment that we die as a, a believer. It starts the moment that you believe. Then and then and then is when we receive eternal life. It continues on after death, but we are given eternal life the moment we place our faith in Jesus. And John has said that from the beginning of his gospel. John 1, 12, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. John three sixteen, For God so loved the world that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Right? Um, he sent his son into the world. And so John three thirty six, Whoever believes in the son has eternal life. What I want you to realize is that biblical faith is transformational not transactional. Biblical faith is transformational, not transactional. Here's what I mean by that. It's supposed to transform us in every aspect of our life, not just to be a transaction that we have every now and then when we need something. See, a lot of Christians say, if I believe in Jesus, then I go to heaven. Or, I'll believe in Jesus so that I could be better financially off. I'll believe in Jesus so I'll have a better life. I'll believe in Jesus and just fill in the blank, like a blank check almost. Transactional faith is that if you do something for God, then God is obligated to do something for you. And that is the furthest thing from the truth. God is not obligated to do anything for us. We're the ones obligated to God. He is the creator he is the ruler and the sustainer and the savior of the world, not us. But faith is supposed to be transformational. God wants to, us to be transformed every single day. And we put our faith in him. And it begins the transformation process as we're saved and we're put into God's family. But that transformation continues to change us from the inside out all the way until one day we see him face to face and we're glorified in his presence. So let me ask you, a big question. Is your faith right now, is it transformational or is it merely transactional? Is your faith transformational or is it merely transactional? And here's how you know. Are you expecting God to do something for you because you did this for God? Or are you actually changing into a different person over time? Are you becoming more and more and more like Jesus? Not in an arrogant, oh, look at me, I'm perfect kind of way. That's not like Jesus at all. But are you serving more? Are you living in humility? Are you looking out for other people? Are you telling others about him? How is your character changing? Is it looking more like Jesus or is it still looking the same? Because transformational will lead to the change that Jesus desires in you. Transactional is not going to lead anywhere. So is your faith a transformational faith or is your faith just a merely transactional faith? God wants to meet us right where we are, but he refuses to leave us that way. He met Thomas right where he was and Thomas left change. He met us right here this morning, but he refuses to leave you in the same place. Will you leave changed? When that next problem hits, what are you going to do? What is going to remain standing in your life when that next issue occurs in your life? God wants us to have a rock-solid faith in relationship with Jesus. If everything else crumbles around us, God wants that relationship with Jesus to stay strong and steady. Biblical faith, man, that's appealing, that's transparent, that, that's what we need right now. That's what I need. It's what you need. It's what this community and our world needs. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We ask that you would uh, do what only you can accomplish in this time, Lord. God, I don't know all the decisions and areas of people's lives and hearts that um, need you to uh, show up in and work in, but Lord, you do know those things. And I pray that you would work for the glory of your name in their life. Lord, I pray that in these next few moments of uh, our time of response, God, that you would give us a spirit of freedom 
that people would respond to, to what you are calling them to do in, the, in, your, in their life, Lord. Lord, for those who do not know you, I pray that, God, that they would trust in you for the first time today. For those of you who are far away from you, Lord, I pray that you would go to them, that you would come to them, invite them back to yourself, as I know you've already done, just like you did, Thomas. Lord, we pray that you would continue to move in our midst this morning. And we give all this to you, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would stand with me, if there's a decision that you'd like to make, I'm going to be down front as we respond.